I told him I would do that. <laughs> Anyway, when the shepherds were out there in the field, you know, they had been looking forward, well, for their whole lives, but the entire nation of Israel had been looking forward for, what, 1,500 years, 2,000 years, something like that, when the Lord had first promised Abraham that he was going to create out of him a great nation, and then uh, the, the promise of, of, of the seed of, of the Messiah who would come, that same promise given to Isaac, that same promise given to Jacob, and so for generations and generations, this promise of the Messiah. And of course, in the shepherds' minds, they would not be the ones to know about this because shepherds were just, they were the bottom of the barrel. They really were. And then to have that whole angelic chorus right there in front of them say, hey, guess what? It's happened. You guys are the first ones to know. Go into Bethlehem, see this newborn king. How great would have been their joy to see that. Let's sing together how great our joy. say that the shepherds did after they went into Bethlehem they saw the child they saw this thing that has been announced to us they said they went out from there and they began to spread the word everywhere now, have you thought about that for a minute the middle of the night and they went down to the to, to, to Bethlehem they saw the baby and in the middle of the night they're knocking on doors telling people what would you do if someone knocked on your door in the middle of the night hey I've got this tremendous news this is how excited they were to share that news. They were out there literally telling everybody that they could find. And this is the idea that we as believers are supposed to be doing. Maybe not at 3 in the morning knocking on people's doors. That's a good way to get shot today. But just the idea of spreading around. We are to go into all the world, whether that's our own neighborhood, whether it's you know, somewhere overseas or wherever. But we are to be spreading this gospel, this good news that Jesus Christ has given to us, that God the Savior, God with us, has been born. And this good news that we can have our sins forgiven, be in fellowship with God, and spend eternity with God. And eternity is really a long time. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's sing. Shout to the north. <laughs>
Rise up, women of the truth, stand and sing to broken hearts, who can know the healing power of our awesome King of love. Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west, Jesus is Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Rise up, church. stand with me this morning please as Neil comes up and leads us in our scripture reading is that on it is all right scripture this morning is from first Corinthians 11 through 23 through 29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Father, we are so humbled by your love that you have for each one here, in fact, each one everywhere, that you would take your body and have it brutally crucified on that cross as your love poured out for each of us. Father, I pray that we don't just remember you when we read these words or we partake of the elements, but that we remember your sacrifice daily for us. For without you, Father, and that sacrifice, we are lost. Thank you for each one here this morning as we look forward to the message that you have laid on pastor's heart. And we just pray that your love permeates through this service. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Man, you may be seated. Let's continue singing this morning. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Don't, don't ever get the idea that the Lord is just going to, as he's in the business of blessing people, that he's just going to kind of 
pass you by. Okay, you had a good blessing last week. It's not your turn this week. Yeah, God continues to bless us each and every day. In fact, and I mentioned this before, I encourage you if you have not done so, get a notebook, three ring binder, whatever. Just start writing down all the ways in which God has been working in your life. God's timing, the, the way that God answered a prayer, just some out of the blue blessing that he gave to you, whatever it may be. Um, and just write those things down and go back then and review those things. This is what God told the people of Israel to do. Go back in their history, look at all the ways that I've blessed you, look at all the things I've done, and see that I am a faithful God. We don't really have to ask him not to pass us by, but sometimes it's nice just to remember that he doesn't. Sometimes it's nice to remember that God is constantly working in our lives. So let's sing together. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my cry. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, Say As we were sitting the other night together with my wife in the living room and she was reading different posts, I believe on Facebook, she read something that Nan had reposted, something to the idea of, I didn't know that marriage would turn out a daily or everyday struggle on figuring out what to cook every day for the family. And that's the question that we ask each other quite often, or my wife asks me, so what do you want to eat this week? Well, my answer is simple, hot dogs and burgers. What do you eat? Uh, what do you plan? And it turns out that if you don't plan what you're going to eat that week, you're going to wind up eating stuff that's not good for you, right? You will extend and reach out to grab whatever is easiest. Let's order a pizza just to get it done, or whatever it may be. We tend to take life as a habitual order. What we've done, we'll do it again, and it becomes a ritual. The danger there is that church may become a ritual, and what happens in God's house does not reach our hearts to understand what it really means that we are here to listen to learn to drink deep to be transformed to leave changed than the way that we came and this is where the Lord comes in and we mentioned this last week that the Lord Jesus said as he prepared this meal I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you. 
before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And there they sat, and he took the bread, and he broke it, and he took the cup, he poured it, and he passed it, and talked to them about a new covenant, new meaning, new strength, new grace. But he talks about this fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Well, if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, from verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God Almighty reigns. This is after the great tribulation. This is after the great battle of Armageddon. This is after the victory. This is the coming and the establishing of the new kingdom. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And in those words, and at that time, there will be that flash of the memory of John the Baptist saying, this is the Lamb of God that has come to take away the sins of the world. And now, from the struggle and the cross and the Lamb, the Lamb sits and is glorified, and His bride has made herself ready. The importance of preparing looking forward to the day of communion, remembering that the Lord Jesus said, I desired and I couldn't wait and I want to fellowship with you for this is my body and this is my blood. On that day in the kingdom, we will rejoice and give him the glory. But the bride has made herself ready. Communion is not a passing by ordinance. It's not something we do as an afterthought. We prepare for it. We prepare for it days in advance, weeks in advance, even a month in advance. Living your days in obedience, repentance, remembering that we're called to commune and take of the bread, and take of the cup. I weigh my words. I filter my actions. I prepare my steps in light that I've been invited at the table. We mentioned earlier about mother calling you into dinner. Wash your hands. You can't sit at the table filthy. We mentioned about the feast given by a king. And it was a ritual in the Jewish tradition that at weddings they would provide a coat for those that they didn't have one. And this happens if you go to the really posh and ritzy restaurants. Haven't been to those yet, but those places where if you walk in, if you're not wearing a suit, they will provide you a jacket. We want you to come and dine. You may not be able to afford it, and that's a whole different story. But if you want to dine and walk in, you got to put this coat on. And the Lord Jesus talks about this king that he invited people to come and have a meal at at, at 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 the wedding. This one person came. He wanted to sit down, but he would not accept that coat. And that's being the significance and the symbol that it's the grace of God that overcomes and dresses us, forgiving us, making us holy in Jesus. And that's the only way that we can sit at that table of the Lamb's marriage supper. And His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And then I fell to worship. He told me, no, do not worship me. I'm a fellow servant. Worship God. Ultimately, communion. The second of the two ordinances given to us. Go and make disciples and baptize them. First ordinance, second ordinance, communion. Come together and take the symbol, the remembrance. This is my body, the blood. This is my blood that was shed for you. But in doing so, we are called to prepare. Last week, we looked at the fact that we must prepare the table of our hearts for worship. This is worship. Not a passive activity, but active, where we participate. And as I extend to take, I extend to take at the same time that Neil does, and we agree that we believe and accept Jesus to be the Lord of our lives and the Savior of our souls. We talked about preparing this table by approaching with reverence. By approaching actually to contemplate on this timeless memorial. Remembering what he had done and what it meant for him. To consecrate, commit ourselves that as we do this, we walk away proclaiming God's victory over our lives and the Lord's victory in the resurrection. We contemplate, we consecrate, and we commit. We commit that as we take this communion, it will transform our lives to be one, to ask for forgiveness, to give forgiveness, to commune with the Father, to be obedient to all that He teaches us. That's preparing the table of our hearts for worship. But how do we do that? And that takes us to the second and final step. Now that we've prepared the table, we're called to partake. We've prepared our hearts before we come to church. We've prepared our hearts as we sing and we pray, as we look at the communion table, and now we're preparing and we're about to draw near, but now we are to partake. You go to people's homes, especially to people like my mom, or people from, I don't know, let's say that part of the world in Europe, and you may be the same. Actually, there's a big difference, and you need to know this. When you go to an Eastern European's house for dinner or lunch, some of you have already learned that it's not just one course. It's the appetizer, then it's the soup, then it's the main meal, and then you have the dessert. And it's one after another. And the, the more you think of the guest that comes to your home, the more you prepare. Here in our American homes, it may be one thing. And that's it. Enjoy the fellowship, not necessarily the meal. Just enjoy being together. Back in Europe or Eastern Europe, it's you stack one thing on top of another. And before you know it, there's more stuff being put on the table. Now, here's the secret. And this may be in your place as well. One way to show compliments to the cook or your host is by asking for seconds. Because you will have to eat what's placed before you. But if you really like it, you're going to ask for more. So if you don't like it, you're in trouble. You're going to have to really tighten the belt and just smile and say, may I have seconds? It's the idea of saying, I enjoyed your labor. I enjoyed your cooking. May I have more, please? And there you build that relationship. The cook and the host feels good because, look, they came and they loved it. And, you know, they do that. After you leave, the family says, they liked it, didn't they? Yeah, they asked for seconds. They wanted more. Look, there's nothing left. They really, really liked it here. What does that mean 
in the spiritual realm doesn't have any meaning at all. The fact that the Lord Jesus said, I looked forward to, I wanted to sit with you, I want us to partake together, and I'm going to look forward to, I'm going to do it again. There's a point of a climactic expectation and preparation of the partaking. We mentioned it last week. This pandemic has really turned things upside down. It was never meant to be each one with their own little cups and peel this off and take that off and peel the next thing off. It was meant to be of one meal. I trust you enough to sit at the same table with you. There's a meshing of the hearts and a meshing of the lives. All this takes this communion from a religion practice to a relationship, fellowship, and connection. How are we to partake? Partaking at this table of grace with a heart that is reconciled. Reconciled with God reconciled with my brothers and sisters, reconciled with God, being transparent, being repenting, being sincere, being accepting, being teachable, reconciled with my brothers and sisters, understanding through God's eyes and therefore Forgiving or asking God to give me the strength to forgive, to go beyond my feelings and being obedient and forgiving, letting it go, not necessarily understanding or saying it's okay, but letting it go because of the blood of this new covenant. Reconciled. It's hard for us to imagine this type of dinner. And we laugh at the Thanksgiving dinner, right? When family comes from all over. They've lived away from the household for so many years. They have married different people we never expected. We may not agree with some of the things and therefore don't open up these topics. Let's agree to be a family. And it, doesn't, it, doesn't it hurt when our relationships are inch deep, we can talk about the weather. We can talk about the valley. We can talk about the jobs. But we cannot go to the heart level of issues. Because we want to maintain some type of relationships. But deep down... We're broken because we know we're not touching each other's hearts. That's not what Jesus had in mind. When we come to the communion, the communion table is supposed to break my heart and break your heart. And at that level of brokenness, we can rebuild. How do we partake at this table of grace? With a reconciled heart. John 1.17 reminds us at the beginning of the gospel. The law is perfect. The law is amazing. But the law condemns. The law always brings me up as guilty. With no chance and no hope. No right to come anywhere near this table. But Jesus... Why should I forgive you? Jesus had forgiven me. And understanding that forgiveness, all I have from the broken pieces of my life is forgiveness for you. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth. 
grace even over the truth of the sin, the truth of the broken or the broken relationship, the truth over the offenses, grace and truth, the truth of the gospel came through Jesus Christ. And that's how we come to this table. Grace and truth. How do we partake? A couple of weeks ago, Rod and I went to dinner to spend time together. And we went to Wendy's. And I would have never expected... I love Boise. But Boise is not Chicago, and it's not San Francisco, places I've known and grew up in and lived in. Meccas and centers of industry and technology. Never expect that in Boise, you go to Wendy's and you place your order on a big screen. You don't talk to anybody. You just place your order versus uh, on a computer. I'm like, whoa. But, but, but I want an extra tomato. There's nothing on this menu that says, add a tomato. Anybody back there? I want an extra tomato right here. No one to talk to. You see, we could be religious. We can walk in, sit down, listen, take the bread and the cup and walk out. Still judging, still being angry. We're not meant to come to church and type in on a screen or listen in only. It's a relationship where we can be frustrated, we can cry, we can touch. We want to partake, but this means rubbing shoulders. This means hugging. This means squeezing of a hand. This means stomping my foot and saying, I don't understand. It's the relationship. You can't take communion over YouTube or Facebook and be with a family. How do I partake? Well, first, as I mentioned in passing earlier, we approach with reverence. You draw with respect like the, like the tax collector. He didn't dare approach from the back, he cried out, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's no pride at this table. There's the respect and the reverence of the Almighty becoming a man and suffering and bleeding being scourged. So my self-worth, my reaction to life and others comes from my understanding and connection to who He is and what He has done. Everything else is eclipsed. What He's wearing and what He did and what she said means nothing anymore, for I am of all the worst sinner. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven 27 says, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. And that should stop us in our tracks. What does it mean to take communion in an unworthy manner? The New King James Version says that the communion should be observed in a worthy manner. That means I need to prepare not only the table of my heart, but I've got to partake of this meal, of this communion, with a reconciled heart. Worthy manner is reconciliation to begin with. If you take it in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. What do you mean? All that happened 2,000 years ago to our Lord Jesus, if I come at this table and my hands aren't washed, my feet are not washed 
by the grace of the Lord. If I have not accepted that washing, if I have not submitted to that washing, I'm guilty of the crucifixion. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. The idea of discerning here, the idea of understanding of what happened to our Lord Jesus and the way that overflows over my life and how it's supposed to change my life and the decisions I make and the way I live has blessings or consequences. Feelings have nothing to do with this. It's all part of obedience in understanding and focusing. Just look at me, says Jesus. As Peter was looking and talking to the Lord, and John walks by, and he says, what about this guy? We heard stories that he's going to live forever. And the Lord said, no, no, you, you look at me. You take up your cross, and you follow me. As I, as I come to the stable and the Lord becomes my focus, I come and I partake it. I reach out my hand. I approach it with reverence to Him. And everything else takes its place in my relationship with you. This word here of observing it in a worthy manner don't take it in an unworthy manner. It's an adverb. And it describes in the way that we take communion, whether we are worthy. None of us are truly worthy, but worthy in our repentance, submission, and acceptance of what He has for us. In an unworthy manner, we think of Nadab and Abihu. Those that brought strange fire before the Lord. Eli's sons, raised in the temple, watching their father, knowing the ritual, knowing the, the business, became a, such an easy thing. They, they lost the idea, understanding of the holiness and presence of God. One day they decided to perform all the rituals of their own strength and all own ideas and bring in this, this fire before the Lord that was not done according to what was commanded by the Lord in the book of Leviticus. They did it their own way in their own time. Many times people say today, I worship God my own way. I don't like organized religion. Offset and offhand, we reject that idea. But even as Christians, sometimes when things come too close to our hearts and the things that we want and things that we believe, we dismiss offhand some principles that are clearly stated in Scripture. Though we're drawn to a table full of blessing and life, there's consequences to this unworthiness, there's a danger. And Nadab and Abihu died on the spot. We mentioned many times Uzziah wanting to be of help as they brought back the Ark of the Covenant. And David was dancing and it was wonderful. And then the Ark, which they were not supposed to be carrying it on an Ark, they had to put the poles to the rings. And so it was to be carried, never to touch the Ark of the Covenant. As the oxen pulled the cart and it hit this rock or the hole and began to, to, to fall off, he wanted to help and he touched it. Good intentions do not trump God's commandments. And he died on the spot. Ananias and Sapphira, unworthy manner. The whole church was written, they sold what they had, and they brought it to the house of the Lord. It was amazing ministry, amazing miracles, what God was doing. And there's Ananias and Sapphira. They sold this land, and they got lots of money, and it felt good. All they had to say is, we sold it for this much, and we can give in this much. No, they said, here it is, implying and lying that they were giving to the Lord all that they got for it. And they died on the spot in the new first century church. As we come to the table with bowed hearts and reverence, we focus on the supreme price that Jesus paid for our price, for our sins. 
the cruel torture and the humiliation that he suffered on his body, the anguish that he suffered on the cross, both in the flesh but also in the spirit as the sins of the whole world of all time was on his shoulders. Failure to observe this and remember this, that my sins were a part of that nailing of his hands and feet. It says here, I would be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And we would eat and drink judgment to ourselves. Later in the verses, it specifies what these judgments are. 1 Corinthians verse 30, chapter 11. That is why many of you, this is the church in Corinth, are weak and ill. Sometimes we wonder, why, why has God done this to me? Why are these things happening to God's people in that church? Because they were taking communion in an unworthy manner, without reverence, without repentance, without forgiving and forgiveness. Many were weak and they were sick. And in egregious situations, and some have died. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He's our Father, not our judge, but our Father is holy, and the Lord Jesus is King. And there are some things we do not play with. And all these, they are not to scare us and put us into fear, not to come to church on the first Sunday of the month. It's an awakening to what repentance is supposed to be. For then we can walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, being drawn to life and blessings. But I come in repentance. I will not take it with pride. I will not take it with an unforgiving heart. I will not take it without respecting and reverence before God the Father, for there's danger. On a side note, that danger, that sickness, that illness, and even death is the father disciplining the children, not the condemnation to hell. This is, turn with me, though we don't have this in the, in the notes, turn with me to the book of 1 John. We've talked about this verse and chapter in our Bible studies uh, during the week. But this situation in the church of Corinth is part of this explanation of this verse right here. Turn with me to the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of Him. In other words, God listens to your prayers and He answers your prayers. Verse 16, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. And you wonder right away, what is He talking about? Sins that lead to death and sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All of a sudden, you're all confused. You're telling me not to pray for someone that is, that, that is sinning? He says there is a sin that leads to death. Don't even, don't even pray for that. Make a long story short, this is not talking about the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit. That was, that was committed and could have been committed only during the time of Jesus' time on earth. We'll talk about that some other time, not now. So it's not the sin against the Holy Spirit. Nor is it about any specific sin. This is talking about a quantitative sin, kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back, where God said, you've been living in rebellion, we're done with you. You're coming home. And there's a sin that leads to death, meaning the final sin of your life of rebellion. Now, the sin against the communion, taking it in an unworthy manner, could be part of that. What does that mean? That means God puts 
such great importance on being forgiven and forgiving, being reconciled. Remember, our Father which art in heaven, the whole prayer that the Lord taught us, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who, forgive, who have sinned against us. And then at the end of the, the whole prayer, he only repeats one thing. He doesn't talk about holiness, doesn't talk about the enemy. He talks about one thing. He repeats from the prayer one thing. For if you cannot forgive those that have sinned against you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Big and heavy. <laughs> Ultimately, all God wants from us when we come to the communion table is that we come as children asking forgiveness and giving forgiveness, being reconciled. Second, I am to approach with reverence, second, attend communion with quiet reflection. That means be still, my soul. Quiet your heart. Quiet your thoughts. As I often do on Sundays, before I even step into the church, I say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I put on the helmet of salvation. And I go through the whole armor. And I say, Lord, you give me your thoughts. Cast away, Lord, any worries, concerns, or desires, anything from the outside, Lord. I want, Lord, to be centered on you and your word. Attend communion with quiet reflection. Verse 24, as Paul remembers what G or as Paul writes of what Jesus had done as he was taught by the Lord, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. For you. Do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Taking the cup, the whole meal, the whole communion meal, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remember as you take communion of the agony spelled by the hand of love from Jesus as he suffered because of my sins, specifically your sins individually. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me and they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. I can count my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That was David writing a prophetic psalm, Psalm 22. And we know to remember Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he bore our griefs, griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before the shearers is silent, he opened not his mouth. We reflect, we remember, and he begins to open our eyes. 
when I place my life, my wants, my complaints, the unrighteous acts done against me, and I reflect upon what he had suffered, I become like nothing. Reflecting on the Word of God, we reflect on our own spiritual condition. We reflect on what He is, what He has done for my sake. Then I look at my own condition. That's why verse 28 in Corinthians says, Let a person examine himself and then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We cannot take communion until we examine ourselves. Remembering as the Holy Spirit reminds and he taps me on my shoulder, what did you say to Robbie? How did you act with Mark? And it gets heavy on my shoulders. And it's the time I go, please forgive me. I'm so sorry for what I said. And then I can take communion. The Lord says, if one of you comes to the house to offer, to give God an offering, and you remember as you're about to give that offering, the Holy Spirit reminds you that your brother has something against you. Place the offering down. Don't go through with it. God's not going to accept it. Go make peace with your brother and then come back and worship. So as I'm about to take communion, the Holy Spirit will tap on my shoulder and your shoulder. You may have to step out, pick up the phone. In two quick words, please forgive me or I forgive you. And then you come back in and the blessings of the relationship restored and the fellowship and the peace and the wiping away of the guilt will give you life. Reflect, examine yourself. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 18. In this examining, have we accepted the grace of God in our lives? All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to him and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It's all about making peace so that we could be one. So that he can love through us. That is, Christ in God was reconciling the world to himself. As Jesus was being crucified, God, through Jesus, was bringing the world grace and forgiveness. And trusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors. That is what we do. We make disciples and we make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. What are you supposed to do as a child of God? Make disciples and make peace. If what you're about to say is going to bring dissension, don't say it. Walk away. Deal with God, understand, ask questions, reconcile, then get back into the conversation. That is your ministry as an ambassador. And lastly, accept the bread, accept the cup with a desire, a burning passion to be reunited with the Lord, to be reunited with the ones God has given to you as ministry because you live among them, your family, your neighbors, your church, with a passionate desire to be reunited. We see this in the lives of the disciples. Acts 27, on the first day of the week, they were gathered together to break bread. They got together, and that breaking the bread didn't, meal just, didn't mean just taking a meal, eating lunch or dinner. Breaking the bread and having communion, they got together on the first day of the week on Sunday. And when they came, they honored, respected, and were patient with each other. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three. 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Be patient. Wait in a real sense of taking communion and wait in a spiritual sense in considering others better than you. 
we come not just to the Lord, but we come as brothers and sisters. Scripture says in Ephesians 2.13, But now in Christ you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We learn and understand from church practices, scriptural writings, that as children of God, we're called to follow Him obediently through baptism and communion. Because they both proclaim one thing, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Lord of my life. And what we've seen in the New Testament, that as they heard the gospel, they repented, and they said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. And after their new life in Christ and their repentance and their baptism, then they got together as a church on the first day of the week of the month, and they had communion. We don't idolize it. We personalize it. We keep Jesus foremost and up front. This draws me. It does not repel me. It repels away the sin, but draws me to the person of Jesus. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, It is He who has made us and not ourselves. We are the people and the sheep of His pasture. We are His sheep. He calls us by name. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The time of communion is a time of reverence, a time of reflection, a time of reunion, a time that will transform our lives. Looking forward to it and living by remembering Him. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, Yeshua, our good shepherd, we, like sheep, will lay down in this pasture and look deep in your word and find peace and living waters. Give us the joy, Father, as we remember that we are forgiven and your forgiveness is thorough and eternal. Out of that joy, you draw us to be reconciled to you, to seek you, to be obedient in living, remembering you. Thank you for preparing this table for us. Now that we understand even more, we look forward to it and live by preparing so we could partake. Preparing our hearts in seeing you as we follow you every step, with the cross on our shoulders and grace in our hands. As we realize how much we've been forgiven, the joy of being reconciled to others. Bless this church, Father. Let us live in holy fear against our own sin and unawareness that, Lord, would be focused on you and the word that we would be worthy, not through good deeds or actions, but worthy in repentance and praise to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray and wait for your return. Amen.